This is Red Square in Moscow, the capital of Russia, and once the heart of one of the 20th century's superpowers, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. This so-called workers' empire extended its influence from the Berlin Wall in the west to the city of Vladivostok to the east. Every year on May Day, the USSR paraded its military might on these cobblestones for all the world to see. It was truly a force to be reckoned with. The USSR was born out of the 1917 revolution led by Lenin. He wanted to create a new society based on the ideas of a German thinker, Karl Marx. A communist society where wealth would be shared equally by the people who created it. Joseph Stalin, Lenin's successor, pushed through an industrial revolution that looked like it could deliver on Lenin's promises. Everyone and everything had to submit to Stalin's grand ambitions for the Soviet Union. In the 1970s, it looked like Stalin's vision had become a reality. But by 1991, the Soviet people had had enough. They rejected their communist rulers and everything they stood for. Why then, after 70 years of communism, was the Soviet Union so quick to abandon its system of government? The answer to this question lies in the life and times of the last leader of the USSR, Mikhail Gorbachev. The impact of this individual was to bring down the curtain on a society forged in violent revolution. When Gorbachev came to power in 1985, the USSR had fallen behind the West, where consumer goods were better made and more plentiful. Free market, capitalist economies like Britain's and America's were successful. Gorbachev's communist economy, on the other hand, was on the verge of collapse. Unlike recent Soviet leaders, here was a man prepared to confront this problem head on. He traveled a lot across the country, and when he went on trips, he got out of his car, he talked to people on the streets, he was surrounded by people, and uh, at first it produced a very, very positive impression. When Gorbachev came, and he was young, by our Soviet standards, he was young, so he came, new blood, new mind, and the hope was really very, 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 very high. The last three Soviet leaders had all been old-school communists who ruled until they died. But Gorbachev was a younger, new-style leader, prepared to question the way things had always been done. At the heart of Gorbachev's problems were his own people. From the Kremlin in Moscow, communist leaders and an army of officials known as the Nomenklatura controlled everything. These were the very people who brought the Soviet Union to the sorry state Gorbachev inherited. If you take the economic side, it looks like uh, the country was in stagnation. The military spending was enormous. And people already um, in the 80s started to understand that the country cannot support uh, the military budget it had. It was evident also the so-called extensive way of developing the economy it came to a dead end. We needed to modernize the equipment, modernize the, the, the economy in order to move forward. Gorbachev faced a Soviet Union that needed a major reconstruction. But this new leader was no revolutionary. He was a reformer. He wanted to change communism from the inside to stop it falling apart. When Gorbachev came to power, food queues were a common feature of everyday life. But this was at a time when the Soviet Union was producing lots of food. The root of the problem was that the nomenclatura quite simply couldn't get food from the farms to the people. From a seat of power in the Kremlin, Gorbachev knew that only major change could save the USSR from collapse, and that that change would have to start with the nomenclatura, who'd been working in the large state bureaucracies in Moscow since the time of Stalin. This army of state officials planned for the needs of the Soviet Union from year to year. From their offices in the capital, their orders spread right across the USSR. In this centrally planned economy, there was no room for competition and no incentive to improve performance. The nomenclatura simply set targets and expected the workers to meet them. In many cases, they fed false information back to the top of the party to make things look better than they were. Their influence ran right to the heart of the Soviet government. 
By the time Gorbachev came to power, the nomenclature was a deeply entrenched and privileged class within the Communist Party. As far as Gorbachev was concerned, these people and their bosses inside the Communist Party were bleeding the system dry. There's no better example of the destructive effects of the communist planning system than the Aral Sea, once the fourth largest saltwater lake in the world. In the 1960s, state officials pushed through a plan that turned the Aral from an inland lake into a toxic desert. Local fishing fleets are now a thing of the past, and since 1970 the Aral Sea has lost two-thirds of its original size. This environmental disaster resulted from a decision taken in Moscow to make cotton the main crop of the Republic of Uzbekistan. That meant diverting colossal amounts of water from the Aral Sea to feed the sprawling cotton fields. No thought was given to the environmental impact of this decision, but the best forecast now is that the Aral Sea will disappear sometime in the next decade, and with it, the cotton industry. The Aral Sea isn't an isolated example. Lake Baikal is the world's deepest freshwater lake. It had been pure for 25 million years until the advance of Soviet industry. One factory alone emptied 240,000 tons of effluent into it every day. The result? The death of 35 species of fish that used to populate these now polluted waters. The authorities knew and cared little about the effects of their decisions on the environment and the people. All they cared about was making the Soviet Union a superpower. They'd bend everybody and everything to that end. As far as communist leaders were concerned, they could be seen to do no wrong. There could be no god but the party. Before Gorbachev, the communist party controlled every aspect of life. In the USSR, only the ideas of the party were tolerated. There was no room for a competing church. All forms of religion were banned. Books, newspapers, scientific, even artistic thinking had to toe the party line. Any threat to that control had to be put down. Control doesn't push a human society and a human being to develop. Under control, you don't say the things you want to say. And that means you ban parts of yourself because you think that they are prohibited by the society. That means you kind of supervise, you stop your own talents. Because in a scale of a generation, that means people don't flourish. They become ordinary. They don't develop. They don't self-improve. And that's absolutely awful. That was the essence of the society we had. The Soviet people weren't free to speak openly about how they were being ruled. Everyone knew that if they complained, they and their families would have to face the consequences. Any dissent would be silenced. The main agent of this repression was the KGB, the secret police. From its headquarters here in Lubyanka Square, it operated a vast network of informers and investigated and took action against anyone it considered guilty of what it called anti-Soviet activity. The job of the KGB was to defend the Soviet Union against any internal or external enemies. It took its orders directly from the leaders of the Communist Party. Inside the USSR, one of the KGB's main activities was surveillance of the Soviet population to ensure loyalty to the party. It ran prisons across the Soviet Union where it interrogated, tortured, even executed people it thought dangerous to the well-being of the state. The KGB supervised the trial of suspects, which usually ended in locking them away in jails, forced labor camps, and in some cases, psychiatric hospitals. Soviet citizens were left in no doubt about the fate they'd meet if they spoke out against the party. In Stalin's time, millions were killed for opposing the party line. <laughs> 
Mikhail Gorbachev knew that if he wanted to make life better in the USSR, a new approach was needed. Under the twin slogans of Glasnost and Perestroika, he set about reshaping Soviet society. Perestroika means restructuring. Gorbachev wanted to loosen the party's grip on the economy so that people would be able to buy and sell goods at a profit with no interference from the state. Through glasnost, that's openness, he wanted people to feel free to speak their minds, question the past and prepare the way for more honest government. This was Gorbachev's way of handing power back to the people. Glasnost means simply that we, journalists, could write what we wish. And so glasnost reintroduced feedback from the society to the top, what is really happening there because all those KGB agents who were in the society, they were reporting back up only those things that they thought the bosses wanted to hear. And now Glasnost really described our society as it is. And so when we know the real picture, the real, uh, the real state of our society, then maybe we'll find ways to change it for the better. Glasnost paved the way for perestroika. Quite simply, Gorbachev wanted to change the way the country was run. To do that, he had to bring in new people with new ideas at every level of government. Boris Yeltsin was one of Gorbachev's first appointments. He was the new head of the Moscow Communist Party. Shortly after he took office, he sacked more than 100 officials on charges of corruption and laziness. He was a man intent on making his mark. What people realized at that time was that everything was wrong. And on that wave, Yeltsin became very popular because he rejected everything which didn't seem to function. The party was wrong, the party was conservative, the economy didn't work, and Yeltsin became immediately popular. But the more popular Yeltsin became with the people, the less popular he was with senior party members, the very people Gorbachev needed on his side if he were to push through his reforms. Yeltsin missed no public or private opportunity to criticize these people for standing in the way of progress. Yeltsin saw Moscow as a model that the rest of the USSR could follow. Under his guidance, small businesses began to flourish, and the streets were a hive of activity and debate. But the Central Committee didn't like what it saw, particularly people campaigning openly for Russia to leave the USSR. Yeltsin would have to go. A date was set for his public humiliation. This took place in front of Gorbachev and senior party members at the headquarters of the Moscow Communist Party. Yeltsin's sacking in November 1987 showed the power of party hardliners and served as a warning to Gorbachev that the road ahead wouldn't be a smooth one. It also turned Yeltsin against Gorbachev. For Yeltsin, he had a health problem. I think it, it was linked with his heart. Uh, he was in, in the hospital and they actually pulled him from the hospital in order to stage this political trial against him. Uh, when people came to the podium, actually friends, uh, former colleagues of Yeltsin, and who said that Yeltsin is, is no good. And from that moment, he started hating Gorbachev. After that, uh, Gorbachev, that was a big mistake in my view, maybe the biggest, instead of sending him as an ambassador to Portugal, to Ireland. He gave him the position of the Minister of Construction. So he stayed in Moscow with all these connections. It was Gorbachev's big mistake, which shows Gorbachev was not very good at these intrigues at the top. In the summer of 1988, Gorbachev made his next major break with the past. At a special conference of the Soviet Parliament, he proposed a replacement for the Parliament itself, a new Congress of People's Deputies that would be directly elected by the people. This was Perestroika with a capital P. It was Gorbachev's way of giving the people, for the first time, a direct say in how the country was run. When the democracy proposal came to the vote, the delegates followed their leader and voted for an elected Congress. They all thought it would be many years before a People's Congress would come into being. But Gorbachev had other plans. After the vote, he produced a sheet of paper and, to the shock of everyone in the hall, announced that elections would take place the following March. The party delegates voted their approval, even though they'd been given little time to think about what these changes really meant. And what they meant was that many of them would not be coming back. They'd just voted themselves out of a job.
у вас полный поворот в политическом переустройстве страны, в обществе происходит. Я думаю, что многие, проголосовав, только тогда задумались над тем, что это, чем это грозит им лично, такое решение. И я сам слышал, когда выходили, многие говорили, что же вообще мы сделали. While Gorbachev was working his reforms at home, he knew he'd have to strike up a new relationship with the West. It viewed the USSR with deep suspicion. While they preach the supremacy of the state, declare its omnipotence over individual man and predict its eventual domination of all peoples on the earth, they are the focus of evil in the modern world. Ronald Reagan's reference to the USSR as an evil empire was a low point in superpower relations. Before Gorbachev, the Soviet Union and America had faced each other down in a nuclear arms race that the USSR could no longer afford. Gorbachev would have to reduce his military spending and call a halt to the arms race if he wanted to solve the crisis in his civilian economy. Gorbachev knew he'd have to forge a new relationship with the United States to replace the nuclear standoff that had existed since the end of the Second World War. Both knew that neither would survive an all-out nuclear war, yet they continued to build their arsenals. Gorbachev became more popular abroad than he was at home, but he knew he had to win the trust of Western leaders if his proposals on the arms race were to be taken seriously. Gorbachev and Reagan met for the first time in Geneva in 1985. They got on well together as their teams worked to thrash out an agreement on arms control. But Gorbachev wanted more. He wanted to reduce the number of nuclear weapons held by each side. This was a new approach from a new style of Soviet leader. Nothing important came out of Geneva, but the two men agreed to meet again. The next meeting took place in the Icelandic capital Reykjavik in the winter of 1986. There were high hopes of a breakthrough. Again, the Soviets talked about arms reduction and suggested completely removing shorter range missiles from Europe. The session went well until Gorbachev mentioned the new technology that might give the United States the advantage in nuclear conflict. It was called SDI, the Strategic Defense Initiative, otherwise known as Star Wars. I was at Reykjavik and I remember that originally we thought it was a failure because they almost agreed, believe it or not, they almost agreed on nuclear disarmament. Gorbachev had his plan, or idea maybe, and Reagan, to our big surprise, agreed. Let's get rid of these nuclear weapons, these are awful. But then Gorbachev said what this strategic defense initiative, it is uh, stark, was, uh, he didn't understand, even though I tried to talk to him about this, that it's pipe dream, it's impossible technically. The idea behind SDI, or Star Wars, was that America would place above the Earth a series of laser weapons that could knock out any nuclear threat from the Soviet Union. This would mean the United States would have a definite advantage in the event of a nuclear war. Gorbachev saw Star Wars as a threat to world stability. He wanted all experimental work on the project stopped. When the Americans saw how nervous Gorbachev was about SDI, they urged Reagan to use it as a lever to win greater concessions from the Soviets in other military areas. The negotiators worked long into the night. The Americans knew SDI was a pipe dream, but they still used it to put pressure on the Soviets. Reagan and Gorbachev left Reykjavik with no agreement on arms reduction. They made some progress, but Gorbachev felt let down. He'd pinned his authority at home on reforming the weakened Soviet economy. An arms agreement would have helped strengthen it. When the two sides met again in Washington towards the end of 1987, it was a defining moment in world history. The shadow of Star Wars disappeared as both sides agreed for the first time to reduce their nuclear arsenals. My dream has always been 
that once we've started down this road, we can look forward to a day, you can look forward to a day, when there will no, be no more nuclear weapons in the world at all. At this Washington summit, they agreed to eliminate a whole class of nuclear weapons that threatened stability in Europe. No longer could the Soviet Union be seen as the evil empire. At the United Nations a year later, Gorbachev went a step further. Today I can report to you that the Soviet Union has taken a decision to reduce its armed forces. Within the next two years, their numerical strength will be reduced by 500,000 men. The numbers of conventional armaments will also be substantially reduced. His international audience in New York liked what it heard that day. Gorbachev had just finished speaking as the U.S. presidential helicopter was making its way to what would be the last meeting between Reagan and Gorbachev. As the Soviet leader made his way to the summit by car, he didn't know it, but the man with whom he would eventually signal the end of the Cold War, George Bush Sr., would be present. From the American point of view, there was a lot to celebrate that day. Gorbachev had reduced the Soviet Union's total armed forces by a fifth. Now there could be no doubt about his peaceful intentions. When the new American president, George Bush, and Mikhail Gorbachev met again in 1989 off the coast of Malta, the two leaders in effect brought an end to the Cold War that had threatened peace in Europe for over 40 years. Gorbachev told Bush he no longer considered the USA a threat to the Soviet people. He used the news conference after their meeting to announce he now wanted the Soviet Union to be accepted as part of the world community. You understand that today we are trying to turn drastically our economy towards cooperation with other countries, so that it will be a part of the world economic system, we think and hope. The summit in Malta took place a few weeks after the collapse of the Berlin Wall in communist East Germany. The fact that the Soviets took no action against East Germany created a climate of greater trust between the two leaders and their nations. A new era in international relations was born. In the years after the Second World War, the USSR turned the countries of Eastern Europe into Soviet-controlled satellite states whose governments answered to Moscow. The Soviet authorities put down an uprising in East Germany in 1953, showing they'd accept no relaxation of communist control. Three years later, the Hungarians staged a revolt. It was mercilessly suppressed. More than a decade later, Leonid Brezhnev moved against the Czechoslovakian Communist Party. Its leader, Alexander Dubček, was trying to create a more open and democratic society. Brezhnev saturated the country with troops, arrested Dubček and put his own man in place to run the country. It was clear the Soviet Union would stop any moves to democracy in its puppet states to the east. The introduction of glasnost and perestroika would change all that. In Poland in the 1970s, the economy staggered from crisis to crisis. The communist government response was to raise food prices. Workers' protests were brutally silenced, but Poland's money problems continued to grow. Plagued by debt, in the summer of 1980, the government once again raised the price of food. 18,000 workers at the Lenin shipyard in Gdansk staged a strike in protest. Their local action quickly grew into a nationwide demonstration against communism and gave birth to a new movement called Solidarity. The Solidarity strike was born out of a unique alliance in a communist country between workers, intellectuals and a Catholic church that wasn't afraid to speak out. Polish intellectuals never believed in communism. Their cooperation with the workers proved a powerful mix when the country hit its latest crisis in the summer of 1980. What started as a protest against increased food prices developed into an attempt to rid Poland of a communist elite that had lost control and whose words couldn't be trusted. 
Wprowadzajcie nową technikę wyczerpiającą produkcję, ulepszajcie wprowadzajcie nową technikę, wymagajcie wysiłki, ulepszajcie... Czy to, ja, prawdę powiedziawszy, jak ktoś... If you didn't grow up under communism, you wouldn't understand the essence of it and why we had to end it. I was lucky to grow up in a family that knew what communism was about. We knew there was this free world and we didn't have it. We had this taken away from us. I was lucky to read this book, 1984, by George Orwell, and I was able to compare. I could see that one day this would have to end. My father didn't believe he would see it in his life, and we young people thought not even in our lifetime. All of the communist governments in Poland tried to buy their way out of crisis after crisis. Each time things would get better for a while and then they just got worse again. People started to have less and less faith in the communists and at some point the people would reject them. This critical mass of opposition was bound to grow. Something had to happen in this kind of situation. Po II wojnie światowej dostaliśmy się w orbitę sowiecką. After the Second World War, we were handed over to communist Russia. It was never part of the Polish tradition to be a communist country, and we were always fighting it. Even Stalin said that communism suited Poland as well as a saddle fits a pig. It could never work. In the 1940s and 50s, we couldn't beat them with guns. In the 60s and 70s, we protested on the streets, and our people were shot. So that's why we decided to try different tactics in the 80s. And they worked. Those tactics involved a sit-in at the Lenin shipyard in August when workers and intellectuals put together a set of 21 demands. These included the lowering of food prices, but also the rights to organize their own free trade union. The strike wasn't about bringing down a communist government. The workers just wanted cheaper food but Solidarity soon found itself the unofficial opposition in Poland. Support for the strike grew and the country faced economic collapse. With more and more factories closing, the government agreed to negotiate, a move unheard of in any communist country. We had an idea that something big was happening at the time of the strike. Everybody was trying to find out what was going on inside the shipyard. We heard and read what was coming out and we realized that this was not about our stomachs anymore. This was about bigger issues. It was clear what our agenda was and it had to do with more than just food. 90% of people were in trade unions and the issue that they were supporting was from bread we will get freedom. If they stated from the outset that they wanted to change the system, it never would have worked. They would have been killed. The communist government signed up to Solidarity's demands by the end of August. In just 18 days, Solidarity had rocked Poland and the Eastern Bloc to its foundations. It had won the right to recruit its own members and to strike. Membership mushroomed from three to nine million. The trade union had become a major force in Polish politics, with Lech Walesa its charismatic leader. The USSR wasn't going to accept this threat to communist control. It sent troops to the borders of Poland, a clear threat that if its rulers didn't suppress solidarity, Moscow would. So, as the rest of the world looked on, Polish forces set about silencing the national opposition. General Jaruzelski, the newly imposed leader of Poland, moved against solidarity. The trade union was outlawed. Thousands of members were jailed. Lech Walesa was placed under house arrest. But the introduction of martial law did nothing to solve Poland's economic crisis. The communists believed that they could break down the people, the trade unions and me, and manipulate and divide them into enemies. But that wouldn't work. As far as I was concerned, they could kill me, but they wouldn't win. The attempt to crush solidarity was a traditional Soviet response to dissent. But when Gorbachev came to power, he changed the landscape of relations between the USSR and the Eastern Bloc. 
A man committed to glasnost and perestroika at home couldn't object to the people of Eastern Europe finding their own way in the world. Gorbachev said he'd no longer interfere in Eastern Europe. He advised Yaroselsky to sit down with solidarity and enlist its support. With the promise of Soviet backing removed, the Polish government had to talk to solidarity and finally agreed to free elections. The Polish people voted overwhelmingly for solidarity candidates. In panic, Yaroselsky phoned Gorbachev, who urged him to give way to the people. He did, and in August 1989, the new parliament elected a solidarity member as its first prime minister. This was the first non-communist government in the Soviet bloc since 1948. What happened in Poland affected the pace of change in the other communist satellite states. The most dramatic breakthrough was in East Germany, where the Berlin Wall was a symbol of the division between the capitalist West and the communist East. I saw the building of the Berlin Wall on the 13th of August 1961. I lived in the East but was on holiday in the West. I saw people jumping from windows in Bernau Street. These houses quickly became the border between East and West Berlin. School began again, and our history teacher told us that this wall was an anti-fascist protection wall. That's how it was described to us, and that contradicted what I had seen with my own eyes. Why were so many escaping from the east to the west? I just had to leave the history lesson. In the wake of the Polish experience, East Germans had been holding vigils to demand democratic freedoms since the mid-80s. In October 1989, the 40th anniversary of the German Democratic Republic, Mikhail Gorbachev visited its capital, Berlin. Instead of condemning the freedom protesters, he undermined the communist leader, Erich Honecker, saying those who delay will be punished by life itself. Within a week, Honecker was forced from office by a party aware that things had to change. The Eastern Bloc was seeing Glasnost in action, and thousands of East Germans were already voting with their feet. Hungary, a more liberal regime, had opened its borders, and what had started as a trickle turned into a flood of East Germans making their way through to the West. In this new world, a Berlin Wall seemed ridiculous. I knew that Honecker was going to go. I knew that Honecker had to go. I knew that two to three years before he was gotten rid of. At that time he was so old that he didn't really know what he was doing to the country anymore. He'd lost his grip on reality. The economy had come to a standstill. People escaping into the West through Hungary was a big political problem for the East. It was an interesting time, but I didn't think that this would mean the end of East Germany. A few weeks after Gorbachev's visit to Berlin, the keystone to the Soviet Eastern Bloc came crashing down. Good evening. East Germany has agreed to do what the West has been demanding it should do for more than a generation. After opening up the Berlin Wall, the government has now announced it will hold democratic elections. That news came 24 hours after East Germans began to pour across the wall, which for so long had held them in. It means the Berlin Wall no longer serves the purpose for which it was built. Crowds rushed to Berlin's eight border crossing points. Around midnight, an officer in the Stasi border guards decided things were starting to get out of hand and he opened his gate. As soon as word got out that that had happened, the others opened too. Within hours of the government's announcement, people started turning up at Checkpoint Charlie, the best known crossing point to the west. At first they were told, go away, come back tomorrow, and bring all the right documents with you. But the crowds weren't satisfied with this, and they've learned that if they push hard enough, they can have their way. They pushed, on into the guard posts, arguing, demanding, insistent, and suddenly the way west was opened. Checkpoint Charlie was open, and they were through called on by the delighted West Berliners waiting on the other side. Within a year, communist East Germany was reunited with West Germany. It was a radical but peaceful reshaping of the political map of Europe. It was glasnost and perestroika which created the climate for change. Gorbachev never imagined his policies would bring down the communist regimes in Eastern Europe, 
but his failure to intervene with force to prop them up made collapse inevitable. The fall of the Berlin Wall hastened the collapse of other regimes. Hungary had already agreed to hold free elections in the spring of 1990. Protests across Czechoslovakia forced its communist leader out of office. In the country's first free elections in December 1989, Alexander Dubček, who'd led the People's Revolt 20 years earlier, was elected Speaker of the new Parliament. The writer Václav Havel became the first President of the Czech Republic. In just 24 days, the country's new opposition had ousted the ruling Communist Party in what became known as the Velvet Revolution. Romania was Eastern Europe's most notorious communist dictatorship. In December 1989, Nicolae Ceausescu, the country's leader, sent troops to put down protests in Timisoara. 97 people were killed. This action led to a general strike. Ceausescu called for a mass meeting of his supporters in Bucharest, the country's capital. 50,000 turned up, but instead of a staged rally, astonished television viewers saw the crowd raise their fists, shouting, Ceausescu, dictator. The next day, fighting broke out in the streets of the capital, but by now the army was on the side of the protesters. In a final effort to save his regime, Ceausescu appeared on the balcony of party headquarters. He tried to calm the crowds, but it was too late. He and his wife fled by helicopter. They were caught and put on trial by a temporary government. On Christmas Day, Ceausescu and his wife were found guilty of genocide against the Romanian people. They were shot by firing squad. This was Romania's response to almost 50 years of repressive communist rule. The domino collapse of communism in Eastern Europe was the playing out of the democratic reforms which Gorbachev had been pushing through at home. The next stage in that process was the election to the new Soviet Union Congress of People's Deputies in March 1989. Gorbachev's special party conference of 1988 left the battle lines clearly drawn for him and against him. The people who supported reform now had one overriding ambition, to defeat the nomenclatura candidates in the forthcoming election. The election to the People's Congress of the Soviet Union made Boris Yeltsin a rising star. As the country's economic crisis deepened, people were losing faith in Gorbachev. Yeltsin seemed to offer a way out. In his election campaign, he accused Gorbachev of moving too slowly with his reforms. He wanted to move faster towards a free market economy. Gorbachev found himself caught in the middle between the people's champion Boris Yeltsin and the old party elite, the nomenclatura. Yeltsin, although an old party man, enjoyed the politics of glasnost and perestroika. He relished the opportunity to electioneer. The media loved him. He ran a flawless campaign and won 90% of the vote in Moscow. The nomenclatura and Communist Party hardliners wanted to slow down the pace of reform. Every change reduced their power and privilege. The hardliners won most of the seats in the new Congress, but the election result meant the Communist Party could no longer claim to speak for all the people. For the first time, there was an opposition, with Boris Yeltsin as its chosen leader. A year later, each republic within the USSR held elections to its own local congress. This was the final stage of Gorbachev's democratic reforms and the one that posed the greatest threat to him. In May 1990, Boris Yeltsin was elected leader of the Congress in the Russian Republic. He was now the second most powerful man in the Soviet Union after Gorbachev. Yeltsin used his power to put pressure on Gorbachev to speed up reforms and transfer more power from the Kremlin to the individual republics. He knew the hardliners who wanted to keep communist control centralized in Moscow would oppose this. As Yeltsin's star rose, Gorbachev's fell. The hated food shortages were reappearing in some cities. The people wanted change, but they didn't want rationing. <laughs> 
Boris Yeltsin added to Gorbachev's problems by resigning from the Communist Party in July. After much thought, I have come to the conclusion that I must make the following announcement. In connection with my election as President of the Russian Federation, and bearing in mind the transition of our society to a multi-party system, I can no longer follow solely the mandate of the Communist Yeltsin Party. Yeltsin was no longer interested in reform. He wanted wholesale revolution, a complete shift to a free market economy. It was a new political crisis for Gorbachev. Meanwhile, his economic program was falling apart. Gorbachev asked two rival teams to draw up plans for a way forward. The economists worked from government datches outside Moscow. Perestroika was just an economic idea, but Gorbachev, he really didn't understand how economy really works. So he had to rely on advisors, and some advisors did, others advisors said just the opposite. He didn't know what to do, and his main problem was to keep power, political power. One team of economists drew up a plan to allow the government-controlled economy to move towards a more market-friendly one in just 500 days. Gorbachev endorsed their blueprint, but then changed his mind. You see, he couldn't imagine that in a country where everything was just absolutely public-owned, just, let's say, a couple of months ago, there would be people who would become extremely rich, who could own this factory, that factory, several factories, and whole industries, who could control them, who will be not obliged to follow, let's say, directions from the party, from the government. Yeltsin and his supporters backed the 500-day plan. But hardliners forced Gorbachev to take a more cautious approach. Many believed the answer lay in independence from Moscow. They saw Moscow and its central planners as part of the problem, not part of the solution to their economic woes. Boris Yeltsin liked the idea of the republics being free from Soviet control. He liked even more the thought that Russia would emerge as the most powerful among them, with him as its leader. So he joined the chorus for independence, driving a deeper wedge between himself and Gorbachev. This rise for independence was, was one of the side effects of Glasnost. It started in Lithuania. I traveled uh, with Gorbachev to Lithuania. He stopped his car, went into the crowds, and tried to prove to them that it is better together that Lithuania received so much aid from Russia, which is true. And they listened, but they answered to him, we want to be free, even poor. We don't want to be with you. Gorbachev used to say to us uh, that it is a dream. You are stupid. You will never have your independence. We will never permit it. The governments in the Baltic states, Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia, stopped cooperating with Moscow. Vytautas Landsbergis led his opposition party through a struggle with his local Moscow-backed Communist Party to become leader of the Lithuanian parliament. The people tore down the symbols of Soviet domination. They saw complete independence within their grasp. Gorbachev viewed events in the Baltic states with horror. He knew they were leading in only one direction, to the breakup of the Soviet Union. In the Kremlin, the 4th Congress of People's Deputies opened on December the 17th, 1990. Gorbachev came under immediate attack. With violent protests now taking place across the republics, party hardliners claimed his reforms were leading the USSR to destruction. Gorbachev's response was to denounce the Baltic governments. He accused them of being enemies of the Soviet Union. And with or without Gorbachev's knowledge, plans were being put in place to regain control. In January 1991, Soviet troops were sent into the Baltic states on the pretense of rounding up draft dodgers. When they reached the Lithuanian capital Vilnius, they seized the country's systems of communication. One of their main objectives was the television tower. When Soviet troops appeared on the streets, crowds flocked to surround the parliament building to protect it. At the same time, people made their way to the television tower to protest against its occupation.
It was a Saturday. We went to the TV tower at 7 o'clock. There was about 500 of our people there trying to protect it. I left, but my daughter Loretta stayed on. Tanks and troops were approaching the TV tower that night. I saw people trying to stop a tank, so I joined them. I realised that the tanks wouldn't stop and I had to move backwards and I fell right under one. It drove over my legs. Beside me on the ground was a young girl, Loretta. She died that night. We didn't speak. As the situation in Vilnius started to get out of control, Landsbergers broadcast a message from a secret camera in Parliament buildings. He also tried to make telephone contact with the Soviet leader. I tried to call Gorbachev. I was connected only with his secretary, who said to me that Mr. Gorbachev is sleeping and he cannot wake him. Of course it was not true, but I said to him, the secretary, say, your president, that any moment bloodshed will happen and he will be responsible. I blame my daughter's death on the communists. There were 14 people killed that night. The 13th of January was the day we signed for the freedom of Lithuania in blood. Loretta Asanovishuta was only one of the people killed that night at the TV tower. Soviet troops stayed on to prop up a puppet government that opposed Lithuanian independence. Mikhail Gorbachev took no responsibility for what happened in the Baltic states, nor did he condemn the actions of the security forces, but Lithuanians saw Moscow's hand. Faced with growing protests for independence in the republics, Gorbachev decided to draw up a new treaty, relaxing Moscow's control but still keeping the Soviet Union together. He saw his new Union Treaty as the only way to satisfy the conflicting demands of the republics and Communist Party hardliners. But the hardliners had had enough of Gorbachev's attempts at compromise. Gorbachev's vice president and other leading communists moved against him the day before the signing of his new Union Treaty. With Gorbachev on holiday in the Crimea, they declared a state of emergency and sent troops onto the streets of Moscow. One of their main targets was the Russian parliament, the White House. And what they didn't understand, that the movement for a new way of life was much too popular to be stopped by force. Now the people who staged this coup, they didn't understand that the people were different and that the people were not just former Soviet citizens who were ready to be directed in one way or another. These were, well, you can say, independent people who wanted to choose something for themselves. Members of the Russian parliament and its recently elected president remained at large. Leaving Boris Yeltsin free was just one of many mistakes the plotters made. When tanks moved in to surround the White House, Yeltsin seized his moment. He climbed onto one of the tanks, shook hands with the crew and denounced the emergency committee behind the attempt to overthrow Gorbachev. Yeltsin perfectly understood the moment. The tank episode was a historical episode. The picture was absolutely brilliant. Him reading the... Uh, uh, the proclamation on, on the tanks. They, these people who organized all this, they were somewhere in the Kremlin, I don't know, organizing and thinking, trying to control something which couldn't be controlled. And Yeltsin, we had Yeltsin in the open among people, surrounded people on this tank, the, these flags of the Russian Federation waving. That was something absolutely astonishing. That was a perfect scene. The emergency committee thought putting troops under the streets of Moscow would be enough to give them victory. But Yeltsin's call for people to come and defend the White House put an end to that. The battle lines were drawn. 
Thousands turned up to protect the parliament. With Gorbachev now under house arrest in the Crimea, Yeltsin claimed this was a battle for democracy in the Soviet Union. By the second evening, the tanks that had been sent to attack the White House were defending it. The soldiers reluctant to turn their guns on their own people. The emergency committee's plans fell apart as military commanders shifted their loyalty to Yeltsin. By the end of day two, the battle was all but over. In their only news conference, the plotters, among them some of Gorbachev's closest allies, claimed his perestroika policies were a mortal danger to the homeland. But they'd no alternative program for running the Soviet Union. Without the support of the people and the military, on day three, the attempt to unseat Gorbachev ended in failure. Yeltsin sent a plane to bring Gorbachev back to Moscow from the Crimea, where just hours before some of the plotters had tried in vain to explain their actions to the Soviet leader. Now, in the early hours of the 22nd of August, Gorbachev stood exhausted on Russian soil. He knew who needed to be thanked for his freedom and for the failure of the coup. I am grateful to the Soviet people. I am grateful to the principal position of the Russian man. The president of Russia, Boris Nikolaevich Yeltsin. The plotters had wanted to safeguard the USSR. Instead, their actions helped bring about its downfall and the end of the Communist Party. As Gorbachev made his way to his home in Moscow, he didn't realize he'd returned to a changed people. At this crucial point in the history of the Soviet Union, he'd lost the initiative. And when the coup failed, Gorbachev also failed. He returned and in my view he had to go to the crowds and to the parliament. Instead, he went to his private place. So he lost momentum and Yeltsin took all the glory, all the glory for the event and uh, started gradually to push Gorbachev out of the Kremlin, which successfully did by the end of the year. Yeltsin was now firmly established as the people's champion. Two days after the coup, he humiliated Gorbachev at the White House, forcing him to read out the names of those plotters who'd been part of his inner circle. Shortly after this, Yeltsin signed a decree suspending all Communist Party activity in Russia. The next day, Gorbachev resigned as leader of the party and disbanded its central committee. The collapse of the Soviet Union was not far off. At the funerals of the three people killed defending the White House, Gorbachev apologized for the actions of his former supporters during the coup. He was addressing an audience that no longer believed in him or the communist system. By now even he had to concede there was no room for the communist party in whatever new system would emerge from the ashes of the coup. At some moment, the moment came when more and more facts about the coup became known, about how the party leadership had acted. And he came to the conclusion that this party leadership had no place in the system of perestroika. In fact, this party leadership had betrayed him. One of the party leaders, Shenin, even went to the Crimea to demand his resignation. When he returned from the Crimea, he had already decided to leave his post and suspend the activities of the Central Committee. The dismantling of the communist system created a power vacuum that Boris Yeltsin was determined to fill. As the Russian president, he banned the Soviet Communist Party, the last thing Gorbachev would ever have contemplated. This was the beginning of another revolution. Gorbachev tried to make room for public debate in the party. But if we acknowledge that it's a positive thing, we don't think about the basic question whether a party like that should exist at all. And that was the big question which he couldn't afford to confront. Gorbachev had always believed he could carry out his reforms from within the Communist Party, but the coup proved this was an illusion. Within days of the August revolt, Lenin's USSR began to fall apart. Lenin was very wrong when he cut our Russian Empire into national units. Ukraine, Belarusia, Kazakhstan, you name it. These were the places where national party elite decided to go it alone, decided to keep all the riches, so to say, and the power to themselves. So the Soviet Union started to 
be disassembled. Bowing to the new realities, Mikhail Gorbachev found himself working with Boris Yeltsin to persuade the Soviet Congress to vote the USSR out of existence and replace it with a looser union giving real independence to the Soviet republics. On the 12th of December 1991, at the press of a button, the Soviet Union was brought to an end. The people's deputies returned to their republics to run their own affairs. Gorbachev clung to the hope that he'd chair a new central council with control of the wider economy and the military. But Boris Yeltsin had other plans. He met the leaders of the Ukraine and Belarus, two of the biggest republics, and got their agreement to form a completely new alliance of states. Within this alliance, the republics would look after their own affairs with no interference from Moscow. By the 21st of December, eight more republics had signed up to Yeltsin's alliance, the Commonwealth of Independent States. Yeltsin was now in the driving seat as president of the wealthiest republic, a first among equals. Gorbachev was powerless, president in name only. Yeltsin had pulled the carpet from under him. On Christmas Day 1991, Mikhail Gorbachev resigned from his post as president of the now defunct USSR. For the last time, the hammer and sickle flag was lowered on the roof of the Kremlin to be replaced by the flag of the new Russian Republic. And with that, the Soviet Union passed into history. In generations to come, history will judge Gorbachev extremely favorably because all these details we're discussing now will be forgotten. But the main thing will remain, that he changed the Soviet Union from one system to another. He returned Russia to democracy, to the West, to the civilized world. Gorbachev's time in power brought the end of the Cold War and the lifting of an oppressive system from the backs of the citizens of the USSR. But in his own terms, he was a failure. He was unable to reform the Communist Party from within. The hardliners saw to that. His attempts to improve life for the Soviet people also failed. Gorbachev wanted a slow and gradual move away from a centrally planned communist system towards a free market economy. That was his undoing. By 1992, the transformation of the former communist USSR into a commonwealth of capitalist states had begun in earnest. In a period of just six years, the ideas that had been supposed to reinvent the Soviet Union, Glasnost and Perestroika, had instead brought it to an end, and with it, the career of Mikhail Gorbachev. The future of the new Russia now lay in the hands of Boris Yeltsin.